Good stuff. Turn to the book of Exodus, chapter 12, verse 13 with me tonight, please. Exodus, second book of the Pentateuch, Exodus chapter number 12, and verse number 13. They call it the book of Moses. The book of Moses is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Exodus chapter number 12 and verse 13. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. Father, I pray now that you'd anoint your holy word and anoint the messenger. And Father, I pray that you'd open the hear, ears of the people to hear it. And then may they go into their heart and bring forth fruit in due time. In Jesus' name, amen. This is the beginning of the Passover, the start, the beginning of months with Israel and with God's reckoning. If you'll remember this morning in Sunday school, we talked about the procession of the equinoxes, got into all of that, got into the spring equinox and got into uh, the pyramid, great pyramid of Giza. And uh, we were talking about time and the measurement of time. And it's a very important thing with the Lord, the measurement of time. But as far as God's concerned, the year does not start with Janus or January. It starts in the spring. And this is what he told them in the book of Exodus, chapter number 12. When Israel was in Egyptian bondage, been there 400 years, they had to make a choice. They either chose the gods of the Egyptians or they chose to take the blood and put it over the doorpost and lintel. If they obeyed God, they got out that night. When the death angel came through, they were spared from judgment. So it's simply a matter of choice. We have choices to make. God made man in his image. He gave you a volition. You have a choice to make. That choice is a very precious thing because it's your choice. Nobody can take it from you. You can choose you this day whom you will serve. That's your choice. That's your life. It's your soul. It's your eternity. It's your future. It's your Savior. It's your damnation. It's your salvation. The choices that we make are so very, 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 very important. Amen. And this is the condemnation that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Amen. Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. In 1973, I chose my Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior and my Lord. But the first night of Passover, the first Passover, the institution of Pesach, that night the blood was applied. Some were saved and some were not. And my friend, the only thing that that death angel was looking for was blood. He could not have cared less who was in that house. All he wanted was blood. If the blood was on the doorpost of an Egyptian, they were spared. For it's not who you are, it's who he is. It's the shedding of his blood for the remission of sins. The book of Acts chapter 19, verse 18. We read this. The Bible said, And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. I think our brother, who was it the other night, Sunday night, preached about the, the curious books that they burned and they totaled the weight of it there in talents and it was an enormous amount of money. And some of them brought these books and they burned them and they were showing that they were, uh, that they were rejecting the occult world and accepting the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. The liberal world for, for, for a long time, the liberal world has, has, has thrown it into the face of Christians saying we're book burners. Book burning has always been the, the mantra of these people to say that you are a narrow-minded, you know, uh, a narrow-minded, ignorant individual, that you're afraid of the thoughts of others. But dear friend, political correctness is book burning in the intellectual mind. They will not let you think freely. Amen. I'll tell you right now, take that book, compare it to any book on this earth. I'm not afraid of anybody's book. That's God's eternal word. Amen. The book of Acts chapter 19 verse 19 said, Many of them which, had, which used curious arts brought their books together and burned them before all men. And they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. That's a pile of money. That's a pile of money. John chapter number 1 and verse number 10 says this, He was in the world and all the world was made by him and the world knew him not. He came into his own and his own received him not but as many as received him to them gave he power to become the sons of God even to them that believe on his name some received him some rejected him 
When the Lord Jesus Christ was here 2,000 years ago, he forced himself on no one. We either choose to receive him or we choose to reject him. It's not whether you choose the Baptist religion or you reject uh, the Philip, uh, Pentecostal religion. It's not a matter of whether you choose Judaism or reject Islam. It's a matter of whether you receive or reject the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son hath not life. He didn't say that he that kept the commandments or he that is sincere or he that is, has been confirmed or baptized but he that hath the Son. John said that in 1 John chapter 5. Some received him, some rejected him. Matthew chapter number 10 verse 32 says this. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. This Lord Jesus Christ, the Simeon said when he held him up, is one who is set, Simeon said this, he is set to separate, to divide. And he's going to bring heartache and sorrow into the heart of Mary. And of course it was that day she watched her son die. There is no way that you can preach the Lord Jesus Christ without making some people glad and some people mad. He is the great divider and uniter. He's the great filter that's ever come into the world. He filters out religion, self-righteousness, and man's greatness. And by filtering that out, he brings out of you that part that God put in you that was good. That's the image of God. For the Lord Jesus Christ came to restore the image that Adam lost. This is why it says over and over and over again that the Son of God was the image, the exact image of his person. Amen. Hebrews chapter number 1. The book of Genesis chapter number 13 and verse number 11 says this, Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves, the one from the other. And so he made his choice this day. And what did he choose? He chose Sodom and Gomorrah. Yeah. And I hate to say it tonight, but my country has turned into Sodom and Gomorrah. I never thought I'd ever see a day like this. Those of you that are anywhere near my age, you understand what this world used to be like, what this nation was like. And at that time, when I was 17 years old in high school, this would have never crossed the mind of anyone in this nation that this country would have gone screaming mad like it has now. They're advertising Gay Pride Month. And they're running the faces of these people across the screen and they're calling them icons. I suppose they think they've come to the point in the country where they've brainwashed the people enough to accept a pervert as an icon. They need saved. They need to be saved. They need the Lord. Sodomy is a perversion. Sodomy is only the beginning, not the end. Pedophilia is following. Bestiality will follow. Human sacrifice will follow. A man said 35 years ago, and when he said it to me 35 years ago, I thought, man, this is a little wild. But he said the time will come when they have orgies on the altar in the churches to God right inside the church house. And what is that? That is the fertility gods of the Old Testament. It's gone full circle and they're coming back to that and it's going to happen exactly like he said it would right inside the church house. They're going to have them. They're already having them in the dark. You can believe that. And I believe this. I believe that the higher you go in the elitist world, the higher you go, the more religious you become. And the reason I say that is because once you get up there to a certain point, you're going to have to make a decision whether Lucifer is going to be your God or not. And if you choose Lucifer, then you've chosen your final doom. Because Lucifer will promise to you that he can give you the world, and he can. He can give you wealth, and he can. He can give you the kingdoms of this world like he offered to the Lord, and he can. But what are you going to get in, what's he going to get in return? He's going to get your soul. 
Yes, he will. He'll get your soul. So he chose, he chose the plain of, 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 of Sodom and Jordan. 1 Corinthians chapter number 10, verse 5 said, With many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness, wandering and falling and dying. They undoubtedly had perfected funerals. Another day, another funeral. Another day, another death. For 40 solid years, a whole generation died in the wilderness because they would not go in at Kadesh Barnea, one little spot. He offered them through, through Hebron. They could go in and they could take the land. It would have been entirely different as it was when they were camp, camped at Gilgal and had to cross the Jordan River. Instead, they were at Kadesh Barnea. They could have walked right in. Caleb and Joshua said, we can take the land, but they refused to do it by faith. And because of that, for the next 40 years, they wandered and they died in the wilderness. It's sad. Amen. I see a lot of good Christian people wander and die in the wilderness because they never go on the Lord. They never give their lives to the Lord. They've given their soul. They've been saved, but they're fruitless. Amen. And they never grow. And, and, never, and, they're, and they're no good on the front lines. And that's where the battle rages, Amen. the front lines. Amen. Amen such a sad thing but I want to talk to you tonight about the separations that take place separation when a loved one passes that's a separation it's a hard thing to watch a loved one pass especially when you've known someone for a long time I've had two dear people pass from my life that I've known and to put together uh, over a hundred years both of them over 50 years imagine knowing someone that long and then watching them pass from this world. If you don't think you're going to think about that, you're dead wrong. You're going to do some thinking about it. It's going to remind you of your mortality. It's going to remind you that you're here today and you're gone tomorrow. It's going to remind you that this world is not your home. And we don't live for this present evil world. That's a separation. But there's another separation coming. And it's a separation that he talks about in 1 Thessalonians 4. I would not have to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Amen. He didn't pull them up out of the ground. He brought them with him. Amen. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain to the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. We will not go before the event. That's what prevent means. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, and the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. This is a separation. It's going to be a sad thing when some of you kids go home and mom and dad are gone. And you'll never see them again in this world. It'll be a sad thing, mom and dad, when you go home and your kids are gone and you'll never see them again in this world. Or oh, that husband is gone all of a sudden and then it hits you full force. That Bible was true. That wife is missing. You put out an awl, you try to find her, can't find her, she's gone. And then it really grabs you. The Bible is true, isn't it? Yes, it's true. I'm talking about the rapture. That is a separation that's going to take place and it's going to take place soon, I think. Now listen, God's calendar, a hundred years is soon. <laughs> For one that says that the day is a thousand years with the Lord and a thousand years is a day, a hundred years is nothing but a tick of the clock. And a hundred years is more than my lifetime. Amen. And I'm telling you right now, I just feel something in my bones. Amen. Amen. The Lord is coming back. Amen. He's coming back, folks. Amen. He's coming again. Amen. You're setting a date, preacher, no, sir, I'll run from date setters. Amen. But I do believe this, I believe he's coming and when, I don't know. Not even the Son knows, folks. That's what the Bible says. But the Father sure does. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. He sure does. Amen. He sure does. The Father knows. And when he says, Son, it's time. He, ha he reserves that to himself. The devil, the demons, the Son, nobody knows. Of the, of, the, of the rapture of the church. The rapture begins a seven-year time of Jacob's trouble that ends in the revelation. 
It's when he comes out of heaven on a white horse. Behold, I saw heaven open. Behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. Yes. This is when he comes to sit on the throne of his glory Amen. and judges the nations. This is right at the door. Amen. There's another separation taking, that will take place. In 2 Corinthians chapter number 5 and verse 10, the Bible said, We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body. According to, that he, according, to, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. Some folks will have a reward at that judgment seat of Christ. It's called the Bema, and some will not. There's a separation. Some will have a reward and some will not. Folks, it's easy to be a fair day Christian. It's easy to be a mountaintop shouting Christian. But you don't grow on fair days and you don't grow on the mountaintop. You grow in the valley. You grow in the valley. You grow when the battle rages. You find out who your friends are, who your comrade is. You find out who your soldier in arms is. You find out the, the metal. You find out what they're made out of when you go through the hard times together. But it builds a camaraderie. It builds a relationship, a rapport with each other. When you go through the battle, through the hard times, through the dark times, if you go through them together, I know so many Christians. Man, I've seen this stuff. I've been, I've been at this a long time, folks. The minute it starts getting hard, it gets rough, problems come, they hit the door. I'm going to find me a church where I can worship. You're good for nothing. <laughs> you want to be mean, but that's the truth. Because these people that you're running off from need your back. They need you to watch their back. They need you to help them. Now, some of you have been saved for 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 150, 200 years. <laughs> Do you have one single friend, a Christian friend, that you can go back to and say, we've been through a lot together? Or do you have just a pile back there behind that you've left? You see what I'm saying? I've told you time and time and time again, the worst thing you can do in the military is leave one of your buddies on the field. You don't leave him on the field. You don't leave him. You don't leave each other. And one of the first things they taught us in boot camp was to learn how to pick up a full-grown man, throw him on your shoulders, and run with him. And it takes some doing to do that. Amen. They'd be putting me away in a hurry if I tried to do that tonight. Hey, no way. I'm glad I was 17 when I went to Paris Island, not 71. Amen. I want you to notice what it says, though, we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Does that scare you? It bothers me. I'm accountable. The Bible says in Hebrews, I watch for your souls. It's my responsibility. I'm accountable. I'm accountable. I'm accountable to see to it that the truth is preached and that no adulteration is allowed when people try to come in here and adulterate the scripture. It's my responsibility. I have to confront it. And I don't like that. I don't like confrontation. Never have. But I have a responsibility. And we cannot let that happen at Temple Baptist Church. I'm not saying tonight we cross all the T's and dot all the I's. There may be some things we find out when we get to glory and the scriptures and the Bible is quite a book, folks. That's got 66 books in it. It took 2,000 years nearly to write this. This book right here is a profound book. I do not believe for a minute I've mastered this book. I don't know of anybody that ever has mastered this book. And the book is open to interpretation in a lot of things. No question about that. There are matters of interpretation. And Christians don't follow out over certain things of interpretation of the Bible. And, and you know, and I respect another man for if he, if he differs in some areas of interpretation of the book. There are things that, there, that we absolutely, though we agree with the virgin birth and the death, burial, and resurrection, blood atonement. And, the, and salvation is by grace through faith. We understand that. We certainly do. But people differ on certain things. I, you know, I've, I, you, you get a lot of young men, and uh, <laughs> the old-timers called them, they're like banny roosters. I don't know much about a banny rooster. I never was out on the field. But I guess they're talking about that little rooster there that's, that's <laughs> walking around, strutting all over the place, like it knows it all. And it didn't take me but about two years to master the Bible. And it mastered. <laughs> that didn't take long. <laughs> no big deal. <laughs> then for the next 20 years, I, it, it, took me, it took me the next 20 years to figure out, figure out how ignorant I was. 
And then the last 20 years, the Lord's been trying to teach me something. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Just leave it at that. Amen. It's a possibility, a good possibility, that we may have missed something along the way about eschatology or about, 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 about the, uh, uh, the, uh, a lot of other doctrines in the Bible. Amen. We may have missed a point here or there. Amen. Have you heard any preachers confess something like that to you lately? Yes, no. Most of the time they won't confess that because they're proud, spiritually, spiritually proud. But there's one thing I know for certain. I know whom I have believed. I know whom I have believed. And I know he's changed me. I know he's blessed me. And I've seen him answer my prayers. And I know he's doing something here at Temple Baptist Church. And I walked in this house this morning and I felt him the moment I walked in here. God was here. And that's good enough for this old boy. Amen. That's good enough for me. Yes, <laughs> That's good enough. Matthew chapter number 25, there's another separation that takes place. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. Before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. He shall set the sheep on the right hand, the goats on the left. Then shall the king, I like that when they call him the king, don't you? Then shall the king say to them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world, but not so for the others. That's a separation. That's a separation. What makes all the difference for you right now is the simple fact that you have received the Lord Jesus Christ by faith. You've received him. You believe on him. You've embraced him. He's your savior. But the tribulation period is an entirely different situation. It's called the time of Jacob's trouble. The Jew ascends again now to the point, the place of prominence. Church is not here. It's gone. And the world is going to be dealing with the Antichrist and the position of the Jews in the tribulation period. What are they going to do? In the book of Revelation, it says that an angel flies through heaven preaching the everlasting gospel. An angel flies through the heavens preaching the everlasting gospel. And you can read it over there in Revelation, what he preaches. He doesn't preach the same thing that Paul preached over there in the book of Galatians 1, 2. A little difference in it. Same God, but a little difference in the approach. Amen. Could have a lot to do with the fact the church is gone. Could have a lot to do with the fact that there's a judgment that takes place at the end of the tribulation. A judgment that takes place to determine whether they're going to go into the millennium or they're going to be turned into hell. Amen. God is not judging you to whether you're going to go into the millennium you were judged at the cross at Calvary and found guilty and you accept that judgment. And when you accept that judgment, you're justified in the eyes of God because one took your place at the cross. We're justified. You're justified through Christ. That's the justification. So you're, you're finished. There's no more judgment for you as it relates to your salvation. There's no judgment as far as going into the millennium or even going into hell. That's all settled. That was settled once and for all when God saved you. But we've got tribulation saints coming up here in the next few, I don't know, months, days, weeks, years, whenever it happens. And for seven years, a different period that this world has ever known. Different. But in Revelation chapter number 20 and verse 11, it says this. Another separation. I saw a great white throne. And him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. You know, I, I read a little bit into what these, uh, these uh, theoretical physicists have to say as far as I can understand what they're trying to say. I read into some of the astronomy. I read into some of the, uh, you know, some of these learned men and see what they have to say about this universe that we live in, this, this creation, all this. They don't agree among themselves at how big it is. As a matter of fact, they're beginning to disagree among themselves now at the speed of light. Different things that they've taken for granted for so long. Things are different, they say. They say light can travel at a certain speed through a certain area, and then all of a sudden it can speed up or slow down according to the, uh, according to the atmosphere or whatever it's around. It's a strange thing. And so, you know, when you read all this stuff, you say to yourself, well, you know, that's all fine. It's all well and good. I'm not up here to be critical of these people. But who made all that? We don't know how big it is, but we know how big he is. <laughs> Who made all of it? And the day is going to come when he sits down on his throne. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> Amen. 
and it's all gone. <laughs> that in itself is enough to blow your mind. I mean, you're standing here and the angels are singing and you're singing redeemed how I love to proclaim it. And they're gathered around that throne are the multitudes, millions and billions Humanity that's lived, ever drawn a breath of life. Here they're standing before the Creator. You look and see all of this creation. Here you are out there. Then all of a sudden, it's all gone. Just Him on the throne and humanity. Man, you talk about a mind-boggling thing. That's what Revelation's talking about. From whose face the earth and heaven fled away. Now the face has the idea of His identity. When he reveals something about himself, when he begins to manifest himself, and he will manifest himself in stages, the final, total, complete, absolute manifestation of God the Father will only be known through God the Son who takes us into his presence. That's reserved for you. That's the final revelation. Hebrews chapter number 1 says, We beheld His glory. The glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And in Hebrews 1, it tells you how it happened. That light came into the world, Amen. wrapped itself around a virgin, impregnated her, and nine months later, she gave birth to the very God of light, the God-man. The light that came down from heaven, from the hypostasis, from the person of God, from the essence of the Almighty. It came out of nowhere because he can't be found. He can't be seen. He exists, but you can't find him. And that's where that light came from. That's what he's talking about in Hebrews 1. And God became a man. And so the Lord Jesus Christ is the manifestation of God for us, the next generation, the next generation, the next generation. But there will be a final manifestation of God when the Son takes you to the Father. No man knows the Son but the Father. No man knows the Father but the Son. But here in Revelation, it talks about his face. It's like the face of Moses when he came off of the mountain and it glowed. He was not that it was glowing. The people marveled at what they saw because it was unusual. Then the scripture says in Corinthians that he covered it because the glory was fading away. All right. The glory of this face was fading away. Now think about that for a moment. He came down reflecting the glory that had been all over him. Yes. He was carrying the glory down from the top of that mountain Amen. that was shining all over his soul. But it faded away. The Lord Jesus Christ is the very manifested glory of God. Yeah, he is. That's what Hebrews 1 is talking about. The brightness of his glory and expressed image of his person. And upholding all things. He is the very essence of the glory of God. Amen. And yet we can't see him until he makes himself known. Amen. And when that face makes itself known to creation, and there you are. You look down, what's holding me up? Amen. You see, a hog doesn't do anything but stick its head in the trough. And it just slops and eats. The hog eats. Most people are like hogs. They stick their head in the trough. Yeah. And they just eat and never think for a moment where it came from. Amen. Amen. But we. <laughs> look up. We look up. We look up. Abraham, look up. He looked up. We look up. That's the difference between us and the hog Amen. with its head in the trough. God put eternity in our souls. We look up. So the Bible said his face, the heaven fled away, found no place. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. We know these aren't Christians. Because your works have been judged at the cross at Calvary Amen. and found guilty and wanting. Yep. And you were judged and condemned and then Christ took your judgment. Yes. After you're born again, you can, develop, you can manifest the fruit of the Spirit. Amen. And the fruit of the Spirit is the work of the Holy Spirit through the life of the believer. Amen. If it's something that you create and do on your own to try to glorify God, it's called dead works. Amen. And dead works... Amen. 
are useless. It's the wood, hay, and stubble of the judgment seat of Christ. But the works we're talking about here are the works of the unsaved to try to justify themselves and soothe their conscience and make them feel better about their lost condition. And you know they'll do it. If you could start up, there's some fellow that started up a religion not too long ago, and his picture was on YouTube and on the news media. And here he is. He's got his robes on. And you know who he says he is? He says he's the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know what? That's one thing to put him in the nut farm for. But he's got thousands following him. Yeah. That's sad. Amen. That's sad. That's sad. First Kings chapter 18 says, Elijah came to the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If Jehovah, if the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. And the people answered him, not a word. They held, their, held it back until Elijah proved the God that answered by fire, he's the true God. Amen. Amen. Did he answer by fire? What's that that came down on him in Acts chapter number 2? Yes, <laughs> Cloven tongues like as of what? Fire. And they knew in the Old Testament that when that sacrifice on the altar was consumed by a fire that came down from heaven, they knew that God had received that. He's the God that answered by fire. Amen. Hebrews 12, 29, how God is consuming fire. Fire. He consumed it. So the Bible says that he sits on a great white throne. I'll close with this tonight and give you some of the thrones in the Bible. A throne. So what is a throne for? It's for a king. It's for a king. A throne. King sitting on his throne. The one you read about in Revelation is the great white throne. That's the throne of judgment. Nobody gets saved there. Nobody gets saved. The books are open to prove that they're not in the book of life. Nobody's saved at the great white throne. Such a sad thing. There's Ezekiel's throne. How many remember reading about Ezekiel's throne? It's an odd thing because it's movable. It's got wheels. And it's moving about. Why is it moving about? Because the children of Israel were in captivity. And the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was letting them know through the prophet Ezekiel that even though they were carried away to the rivers of Babylon, that he was still the sovereign Lord over their life and that he was going to bring them back. He could move his throne wherever he pleased. If he had to take it to Babylon, he'd take it to Babylon. Amen. Then there's Isaiah's throne, chapter number 6 of Isaiah. When he said, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. And the seraphim show up there. Ball of fire crying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God. Isaiah 6 starts out by saying, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up on his throne. Who was King Uzziah? King Uzziah was a king who didn't have enough sense to understand that when he breached the priesthood, crossed over to where he shouldn't be, even though he's the king, he had no right crossing into the sons of Aaron. And he went in and tried to burn a sacrifice to God, and God smote him with leprosy from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. And he died as a leprous king. And the year that he died, showing them how frail and futile and empty the Israeli kingdom is without the God of Israel, he died. And the year that he died, God gave a vision to Isaiah, a vision that would not only speak of the present time, but a prophecy into the future. Amen that the Apostle Paul quoted over and over and, the, and Matthew quoted it and it's quoted a number of times in the New Testament it has to do with the restoration of Israel. Hallelujah. Amen. Isaiah chapter number 6, the throne. Then there's the throne of his Christ and his glory that we just read about. This is the throne where the Lord Jesus Christ comes back. The battle of Armageddon is over. He's finished it and he sits down on the throne of his glory and he judges yes. Amen. the Gentiles. During the tribulation period, he talks about that in Matthew 25. There's the throne of Revelation 4 and 5. When a throne is seated on a glass, a sea of glass, around it is a rainbow. When God first gave the rainbow, he gave it to Noah to tell him, I will never again destroy the earth with water. It was, in other words, it was a covenant of, of, of peace, a covenant of security. And, of course, you know what they've done with it. You know what, you know what this crowd's done with that rainbow. That's a shame and a disgrace, Amen. what they've done with the rainbow. The rainbow has nothing to do with perversion. Amen. But anyway, he's sitting on a throne, and the rainbow around the throne, a full bow, not just a half circle, but the full circle. And it is here that his sovereignty comes into play. 
because it is here that the Lord is the Lord of the earth and judgment is being poured out upon planet earth. And the only one who could come and take the book out of the hands of the one sitting on the throne was a lamb as it had been slain from the foundation of the world. Throat cut, blood shed, a lamb, a little lamb comes and takes that book and begins to open the seals in that book. And as he opens those seals, judgment is poured out upon planet earth. And the throne of Revelation chapter number 22. This is the last one. We'll turn there if you'd like to with me tonight. The throne of Revelation 22. Verse 1. He showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. Now let me read that again. Proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. Verse 3. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. Now you can read that a number of ways, but the way I read it is that the throne is now merged because the Lord Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father. Right now. He's at the right hand of the Father. But the throne now is merged. In plainer words, the total sovereignty over all creation now is in the Godhead, and God is all in all. That the apostle talks about in Corinthians. Yes. That God is all in all. The, 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 I don't know what word to use, but it's the Godhead working in absolute unison. Uh, it's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all now together as one. No longer, apparently, there's any need for the separate offices, but they're all combined in the one, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost, as they sit on that one throne Amen. in the book of Revelation. Now, of course, you know that Revelation, the 22nd chapter of the book of Revelation, is entering into eternity. That's what it is. There's no millennium here now. This is not a thousand years. They are entering into eternity. This is forever. Forever and ever and ever. Eternal life, folks, could either be a blessing or a curse. If you think that to live forever without God is a blessing, you're sadly mistaken. That would be the worst curse that you could ever imagine. When the Lord said back in the garden, lest they take of this fruit or this tree and eat and they just stopped it because the consequences were so horrible that they would eat that and live forever in a fallen state. That would be horrible. That would be unbelievable. That's horrible. That's horror beyond horror. Eternal life has got to be the life of God or you, could, you, you couldn't endure it. You don't become God, but eternal life is the life of God. But to be more specific, it is the life of the God-man. Second man, last Adam. It is the life of the God-man, the one who rose from the dead. But he bore your, he came down and bore humanity. He lived in it for 33 and a half years. Amen. Merged God and man in a man. Yes, sir. God and man became one. Amen. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. He's God, Amen. and he's man. And when he arose from the dead, ascended the Father, that's the life that he gives us. It'll be an exciting life. Yes. Yes. It'll be a blessed life. It'll be something that you want. Yes, yes. It is something that you, uh, you remember a few years ago, Secretary of State under, under um, Bush, I think he was, he used a term that I had never heard before, but when he used it, it's the kind of term that will make you think. And here's the term he used. The unknown unknowns. You say, well, I thought unknown was unknown. Yes, but think about this for a minute. Think about it. Unknown means that you simply don't know. But, for example, you had a party last night, birthday party, okay? You had 50 people show up, but you didn't know that. So... It is unknown as to how many people showed up at the birthday party, right? That's unknown. But the birthday party is not an unknown. That's not an unknown unknown. An unknown unknown is something 
that you don't even have any, you can't conceive. You can't even imagine in your mind that it exists. It has never crossed your mind. And this is what the apostle says, eye hath not seen, ear hath not heard, neither hath it entered into the mind or the heart of them that believe or for those that, things that God has in store for those that love him. That's the unknown unknowns. Amen. Amen. That's unknown unknown because there's nothing to compare it with. And that's what we're looking forward to. When we draw our last breath on this earth and our body, that silver cord is broken, it talks about in the Old Testament, and we leave this world, we will be immediately transported into the presence of God. You will begin to see the unknown unknowns. Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. I love him, bless him, and exalt him tonight because he's been good to me. If you never see my face again in this world, I'll meet you by the river. I'll know you just like you'll know me. Amen. Will you be there? Lord of mercy, folks, do you have any idea how many people have come through this church that I've worshipped with in 40 years that are gone on to be with the Lord? There's no way I can remember all that. But I know one thing. I'll know them when I see them. I'll know them when I see them. Father, in thy name we pray. You bless your holy word tonight. I pray you bless my brothers and my sisters. Those folks that are watching right now by the internet. Those that will watch this later. Those that will see it on television. Those that will watch it in DVDs. Listen to it on tapes. I pray you bless your word as it goes forth. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, let's stand up tonight.